Good morning, almost afternoon, everyone. My name is Kara Napolitano. I'm your moderator this morning. Uh, I'm the education director for Balcones Recycling. We process the majority of New York City's residential recyclables primarily right out in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Um, so this morning we're talking about a circular economy. So the first question uh, is, what is a circular economy? Uh, with a follow-up to that, what are the different types of plastics? Um, so as uh, the educator on the panel, I'm just going to start us off with a quick definition. What is a circular economy? And then open it up to my colleagues here. So uh, I just want to start by clarifying that we are not currently operating in a circular economy. Uh, we are currently operating in a linear economy, meaning when products need to be made, resources are extracted natural resources from our earth, products are then made, and when we're done with those products, generally, we just throw them away. This is called the take-make-waste model, and it is not sustainable because you end up extracting resources that are often finite or take a long time to regenerate, uh, and then you end up with an awful lot of waste that needs to be managed, and managing waste is expensive, both financially and environmentally expensive, so this leads to the need for a circular economy, a more sustainable model, where once a resource is extracted, Extracted, it remains in use, preferably through some form of reuse, but at least through some form of recycling, leading to little to no, preferably no resource extraction, and little to preferably no waste generation. Um, so with that, I open it up to the panel if anyone else wants to add. I would just add, hi everyone. Um, I would just add that uh, we right now, uh, the foundation has done some research in terms of our transition from linear to circular and right now only about seven percent of the economy is circular and that number is actually decreasing because of the level of industry that is increasing in a linear model so um, not only do we have a really long way to go but we are actually kind of backtracking in terms of this take make waste uh, model that was just articulated not to start with a doom and gloom message, apologies. <laughs> but that's why we're here, right, that's to try to advance here. the, yeah. And Anyone else want to add to that? All right. Um, so there was a follow-up to that, what are the different types of plastics? And I'm happy to give a quick overview unless anyone else wants to jump in on that one. All right, um, so I will just say there are many different types of plastics, <laughs> and a lot of things are made. If you look around this room, we, we won't go there. It would take a long time. Um, but there are seven plastics that we as consumers are commonly going to be coming in contact with and purchasing at the store, basically as um, you know, products or packages or, or containers. Uh, and those are plastics number one through seven. Uh, if you see the little resin identification number on plastics, that's that little recycling symbol with a number inside it. That's not telling you that plastic is recyclable, it's telling you what type of plastic it is. Um, some of them are recyclable and some are not. That's what I'll say there. And then I'll go on to question two. Uh, and of course my phone is uh, going to freeze, but here we go. Great. Uh, so question two, what are the ways that we should engage plastic reduction and production and how can the circular economy be improved? I think you're going to start with this one. Am I? Okay. <laughs> so it says in my notes. I, for the first time in life, have slides. I'm the only person with slides, so <laughs> I was trying not to answer the questions because I have a bunch of slides. And so once I start, I, that'll be all I say for the entire hour. So um, my name is Melissa Miles. I'm the executive director of the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance. Mm -hmm. I was feeling very calm till I saw a couple of my colleagues come into the room. Now I'm, I'm super nervous. I, and now I have to bring my, my A game. Uh, so, dun, dun, dun. okay, so I'll skip a bunch of stuff like what we do. You can go to our website, njeja.org. We do a bunch of stuff. Um, I decided to put on this slide, we partner with um, many organizations from the grassroots to the regional, to the national, we're on several platforms such as Climate Justice Alliance, but these are some of the partners that we work with on uh, you know, waste reduction, zero waste, and so on and so forth. Um, and so to, to answer some of these questions, uh, I think that we are basically, you know, I, oops. okay, so, Normally, I just speak from the heart, but I thought, let me bring some slides in case people want evidence of what I'm talking about. So, um, you know, from a climate 
uh, perspective, you know, we have to reduce. So I, I understand that the panel's about circularity, but we need to take plastics out of production uh, first and foremost. And there is a climate imperative for that. Um, and, you know, as uh, Ms. Diane said, the issue really starts with, with extraction, but it starts a little bit before that in, in the economic drivers um, of plastics productions. Um, so, you know, just to start sort of on the, the lighter side is, is the climate impact. That's the lighter side here, right? So, um, you know, they, they're driving climate change, the production, you know, the extraction, the production. We cannot continue to extract and produce plastics the way we are without having um, major climate impacts. And, you know, I, I just thought I would bring a few slides. I think you all get these so that you can see for yourself. I don't need to belabor this point. Um, but really, let's see. There's a bunch. Okay, actually we, they're not quite in order. Okay, sorry about that. Ah, vision, so this is the sort of light vision for a circular economy. Um, to the last question, elimination of problematic or unnecessary packaging, um, reuse models, all plastic packaging is 100% reusable, recyclable, or compost compostable, um, you know, fully decoupled from the uh, consumption of finite resources, free of hazardous chemicals. But I don't, you know, honestly, this is not something that my organization really puts a lot of stock in because we are not just looking at climate. We are looking at the health impacts on people who live closest to the sources of extraction and um, of, uh, you know, discard of plastics. And when you put it in terms of human health, I think the crisis is much more real than it is like a slow climate death. It's the real, you know, death from emissions and, and air pollution and pollution of water that is happening as we speak in communities that host facilities, um, even that recycle plastic, I've seen it, right? Like where we're from in Newark, there we, we are on the largest port on the East Coast. Guess what our number one export is now? Used to be all kind of things, now it's waste, right? So we've seen what it looks like to see millions of bottles stacked up on top of each other. Whereas most people can throw it in the recycling bin and never think about it again, we saw it on the other end. And then someone else sees it when it becomes even more toxic than it is in that state. So, you know, that's the where I think we sort of come into this all. Um, and I'm actually gonna pause there and let other folks before I go to something else. I'm gonna jump in here. Um, my name is Dani Cheka. I'm with the Association of New Jersey Environmental Commissions. So I'm curious who else is here from New Jersey? I see one couple of friends here. That's awesome. Yay. Thanks. You would have thought I was from Europe. It took me three and a mm half -hmm. years to get here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sometimes. New Jersey Transit. New Jersey Transit. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So a um, couple years ago, New Jersey passed the plastic pollution reduction law that banned plastic bags and um, paper bags and certain stores of particular size as well as straws upon request and styrofoam. So we don't have, as Ms. Diane talked about, those, those trees with plastic bags on it, which is very exciting. But also another part of the law is that it created a state plastic advisory council. And to build on what Melissa was sharing, um, one of our goals is to work on uh, at the state level in bring, build, bringing reuse and refill um, to, to New Jersey, and how can we do that? How do we adapt from the systems change? We gotta get to scale from building reuse, and the, the real focus here, again, as, as it's been talked about, is really about waste reduction. So I just wanna share some quick stats from Upstream Solutions, which is the national leader in reuse and refill, is um, there's one trillion disposable food products used annually, approximately, and that, that's about 25 Empire State buildings. That's the equivalent weight. And can you imagine that much uh, waste that's being produced? And there's 20 billion uh, pieces of litter generated 
um, just from these disposables. So that's that's our you know our focus uh, for reuse and refill is is packaging reduction and clarifying health and safety requirements um, and just elevating uh, the current reuse stores that are in New Jersey right now and encouraging more zero waste options. All right, I'll move us on. All right, question three, and this is a three-parter, so get ready. Uh, are there case studies where policy measures have proven to be effective in supporting a circular economy approach to help address the plastic crisis? And just to add the, lead, the second and third part, what are some of the challenges to getting these policies established, and what is missing from these policies? So the policy question. So I'm happy to share um, and start, and I think it, it's very connected to um, what Melissa and Adini were just referencing. And it's, I'd say some of the bright spots with plastics policy have been at the local and the state level. And right now, I'd say the focus is on EPR, extended producer responsibility, that puts the producers of plastics in an accountability seat for what happens to those plastic bottles as they pile up. And I think that is incredibly critical. And it's it's now enacted in the EU. It's a little too early to tell what impact it um, is and will have. But I think that is a really critical policy. And the challenge with it right now is it's happening at the state level, right? And so it's happening in a bunch of different iterations. And there are some um, I think there are four states right now that have EPR in the U.S., and there are some that are really kind of transactional and kind of checkbook cost centers and don't necessarily engage the business sector, don't engage uh, an innovation agenda at all. And there, what? The four states. There's Colorado, California, Maine, and there's one Oregon. Other, Oregon. Oregon. There we go. Um, and so they're, they're quite different, and then it's, it's quite hard, actually, for business to engage an, with separate policy in each state and sometimes like opt out, right? So we need more federal and global legislation on that. And uh, to that point, one of the, so what's happening right now is that we're trying to get a global treaty passed. The UN is holding a series of sessions to create a fairly binding plastics treaty that makes member countries accountable to their own plastics production and pollution and drive circular models. And as you might imagine, those negotiations are really tough and different member countries have very different points of view. And we are, so there have been five, what we're calling INCs, um, kind of the, the member states coming together to negotiate this treaty. It's intended to be completed by the end of this year. It's it's possible that it will. I think it's it's unlikely that we'll get to something that really has teeth by the end of this year. Um, but that would necessitate you know, global cooperation on plastic pollution, which is where we need to get to. And right now, the language is should and maybe, and it needs to be must. And that's kind of what we're trying to inform between now and the end of the year, if not in early office? next year. I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll stop at the end. But that was actually the point I was talking about, CL. You were in Ottawa. No, I wasn't personally, but a bunch of my staff were. Yeah. Because this has been one of the key things from CL to Center for International Environmental Law. But you might explain the process, because the, the attempt has been to pattern it on the IMCC. And previously negotiated treaties, many of which have been over 10 to 12 year period. But one of the big things that was uh, agreed upon by 166 countries this past year was the right to a healthy environment, mm -hmm. which was first introduced even before I was born in 1948. Mm -hmm. So the pace at which this has become uh, an aware challenge for humanity is beyond glacial, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, glaciers are moving quite quickly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, really it's fast. a trigger you spot know, for folks. Moving very fast. So I just, yeah. I just wanted to make the large part. And then there have been pieces along the way, like the Ram the Bannacle Accord 
or the, um, oh, I knew I should have stated before I tried to think of it. The, the, did you write that down? Oh, oh yeah. so sweet. Yeah. I'm so That's sweet now. Down. But anyway. No, no, no. No, no, no. Anyway, no, no, no. Don't try. Um, <laughs> but it was in terms of hazardous, hazardous materials. Yeah. So the levels of which, but what's been striking is the lack of going to the pressure on actually source materials for plastic. Because if you do a survey in this country, so few people realize that oil, fossil fuels, are actually at the source of the creation of so much of that. So that, that speaks to the whole educational component. Mm -hmm. And I hope you'll just talk about all of these pieces, because not <laughs> unlike in the story of tobacco, the fossil fuel industry has, my word, played the, has played the same game of defer, diffuse, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. confuse, and I would say lie <laughs> about, <laughs> oh, why be subtle, you know, you know. Um, so, uh, so I just hope we talk about how all of this comes into play with this. And, and, and I really will shut up. But one last piece, if even at the local level you're trying to address these things, health codes in local communities are directly inconsistent with you know, I, I'll go up to a Panera and want to reuse the cup. They say, we can't. Mm -hmm. If it's crossed the threshold of the counter, mm -hmm. we can't use it again. So we have different institutional authorities. Don't frequent those places. <laughs> Within, but, well, no, and I, I understand that. But at some point, you, there's no places. Yeah. Because that's, a, that's a health. I find that. No, but I'm, ch I'm just telling you, in some places, that means you go nowhere. Yeah. And it's, because it's, it's infiltrating it's multiple multiple agencies, and has then, been you know, right. not and just the waste industry, but no, and that's okay. the yeah. point. Yeah, including everyone. The, in the levels at which the co-mingled, counterproductive, conflicting structures are needs is we need like a big map and showing the all the ways in which. And I think that that kind of raises it because you know a lot of the conversation is is about recycling but often needs to be about reduction and reuse as as Melissa is saying it really has to start at, at the top at reduction and you know I I'm a recycling educator reduce educators don't exist <laughs> and and I try to incorporate that in into what I teach and also always make it very clear that recycling is it is real, but it is a last resort. You know, recycling is not a hoax, and it is a part of the equation, but it is the smallest part of the equation. And it would be a hoax to believe that recycling alone is, is a solution. We have to incorporate reduction and reuse, and just being able to bring your own containers, and also just everyone building that habit and that becoming the norm, more so the norm. Can oh, I, the questions are coming. Can Kara, you hold can it? I, you have to hold it. <laughs> can I just build on what you said, Kara? Because I think yes. you made an important Thank point. And, yeah. and we work very closely Remember? with the Alan MacArthur Foundation. We're part of the global commitment. So we've committed to making all our packaging recyclable, reusable, or compostable. We've committed to getting rid of problematic, which includes PVC, which is very harmful to our health. And the Ellen MacArthur Foundation Global Commitment had major corporations commit to a reduction goal. So we did make a reduction goal to reduce the amount of virgin plastic that we use by one third. That's our, you know, first goal, and that versus our baseline of 2019. And we're actually tracking pretty well. But the point I want to make is there's no silver bullet here. Mm -hmm. So yep. reduction, I agree with, is the more we reduce, the less we have to recycle, the less we have to you know, change the models that we, how we deliver our products. We have a multi-pronged approach at Colgate, so reduction comes in the form of designing it out, it comes in the form of changing the way we deliver our products. Um, the pr challenge we run into there is like, we've come up with toothpaste tabs, which gives us alternative ways of packaging. We can put it in a carton now instead of a plastic container. But consumers don't want to chew their toothpaste is the problem. <laughs> Most people still want to use a paste. So, so there's a behavior change. That's where we need the education. We do believe circularity is important as well, though. So we are trying to make everything recyclable. And, and there's a lot of work to be done to, to help people learn and, and recycle. But I think all of the levers have to be put in play, mm -hmm. not just one or two. So it, it's challenging. Well, and I'll just add on the global commitment because I think it's such an important point is 
um, so th the model that the foundation typically uses is a coalition building in a pre-competitive space, right? Bringing large companies to set overly ambitious targets and then uh, work in collaboration with each other kind of behind closed doors on what's working, what's not, where's the tar in the road, because this work is hard work, particularly if you're the large multinationals, right? You're, you're shifting a Titanic. Um, and we're five years into this 10-year commitment, and at this midway mark to the reduction conversation, the global commitment companies have lowered their production um, and reduced their plastic use by 11%, and the global market has increased by 13%. So that's almost a delta of 25%, right, between these companies that have signed up to the, these targets and have support. And I think most importantly, but Anne would love your take on this, like, in conversation with each other and like have optics into, again, the insides of companies and shifting this work. Um, it's largely led by the chief sustainability officers, but needs the CFO and needs the CEO and needs the head of supply chain, right? Like needs the, the folks that are running the operations of the business to be engaged and to have a motivation to do so. That's very true. So I just wanted to um, answer your question about um, barriers, yeah. right? And that, that also leads us into the yeah. next question, so perfect. So some of the barriers that I've encountered are um, like the chemical associations. Um, you know, it's what, eight, seven or eight base chemicals that make plastics. You know, there's very little R&D from what I understand. A lot of the uh, investment goes into expansion, um, much less into figuring out, okay, what, what else could we be using um, aside from very toxic products like I mean, I just don't want us to be lost on the sheer toxicity of plastic. You know, I had friends that were midwives that said, my child will never touch plastic. It's very difficult, almost impossible. Mm -hmm. But people who understand what plastic really is, like they don't really, and we do come in, like you said, it's everywhere, it's in everything. But even the recycling of it, you know, it's still toxic. It's still toxic when you turn it into something else that is plastic. So. I mean, I don't really, I don't want that to be lost that, you know, in my work, it's hard to talk about a single issue because really the overarching issue is, is again, like there, the biggest barrier are the business models of, you know, different corporate, you know, from the local businesses that must have ways to, sur to survive, right? An incinerator, its business model is that it must have trash and plastic burns hot. Right, so if you have an incinerator that's full of food and you want that plastic because it burns so hot, it can help even out all of that food waste. You know, if you are a recycler, you must have plastic. If you are, you know, and, and then you have the enormous, the multinationals. So it's like we're, we're basically fighting business models, trillion dollar business models. And so to me, that is really the barriers that you know, we live in an economy where profit is literally more expensive, is more important than people. Yes. And there is no way around it. Plastics create sacrifice zones. They create pla places where some people's lives are disposable. Because there's no way that if this, if any of it is in your backyard, you are happy and healthy. A everything from the production to the recycling to the, all of it you know, is, is somewhere someone's being poisoned. And unfortunately, what circularity turns into is pl our plastics in, in the global south, right? There's such thing called waste colonialism. And it means that, you know, we reuse, it, and it's, it's greenwashing. And so, you know, I just, I understand like the reductions and the big corporations and it is like moving you know, uh, the Titanic, but we are literally on the Titanic. Like we are playing the fiddle to plastic reductions as we go down. It's in our brains, it's in our breast milk, it's in our food, you know? So I, I just struggle <laughs> in conversations like this because it's like, you know, um, when you, you know, in work like ours where we sort of take on many, many issues, this is, should be the no brainer one, but we're still having to convince people 
you know, that like actually it's a massive shift that has to happen and, and companies will not benefit from it. If you were still trying to make a profit, you will not, you can't, right? There's something that has to shift where we need to put people before profit, but you know, again, business models. Does anyone else want to comment on barriers to the, yeah, yes. to the solutions? Yep. Um, to add on to what Melissa was sharing about barriers, and I'm I'm just going to talk more at a local level. For, from our from the New Jersey perspective, we did a grassroots effort to get the state plastics law to go through, and one of the things that was a challenge was data. Uh, at the plenary talk this morning, they were talking about measurement, how that's important to have the right data to check your progress. And yes, so in New Jersey, we have partial data that shows us 11 billion single-use plastic bags have been eliminated from the waste stream in the past couple of years since the law has gone into effect, which is fantastic. But that's just partial data. The thing that's missing is uh, we don't have a full scope of the amount of litter that's um, being picked up and, and, not, and we don't see. So I do litter cleanups. It's, it's part of something else that I, that I do. So it's great when I'm out there and seeing, but that information needs to be collected. So that data is missing, and a lot of times we don't receive um, in sufficient information from our, our businesses because it might be proprietary information. So we don't we don't always get that data. Um, the U.S. doesn't follow the precautionary principle when we make decisions on what to produce, and that's an issue. The EU does, and I'd love to see us doing that, and that would go a long way. Um, and enforcement. Um, so even though New Jersey has this good law now, but the enforcement capacity and the compliance, it's now starting to lag. So we have to continue. We, have, we need that political will. And then the last thing I want to talk about barriers is just all of us, you know, we're bombarded with information overload because everything is interconnected. So how do we, as, as advocates here, get through that anxiety and that helplessness that a lot of people feel and get them the information that they need that's accurate um, so we can move forward and make progress? And all right, moving us on to uh, question five. What is the role of the nonprofit, government, and private sectors in developing as well as ensuring execution? And I think you were going to start that. Yes. Um, so I think we've touched on this a lot already, but partnerships and working across all sectors is going to be the only way forward. So as I mentioned, we're part of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, but we work with a lot of other NGOs and nonprofits um, in our, you know, in our quest to move to circularity, don't doubt the reduction goal, I agree. I have some, we need to get, deliver toothpaste to people, so, because that's a part of their health regimen, so it's tricky. So we're looking, again, at alternative materials, but you have to find materials that are compatible with the toothpaste, so it takes time. It'll take time. In the meantime, if we can at least keep plastic that we are using in use, we think that's important. But, um, in order to make our packaging 100% recyclable, we ha our biggest part of our business is our toothpaste, which comes in a tube. The old tube was not recyclable because it had multi-layers of different types of plastic and an aluminum layer in the middle. And that was there to preserve the fluoride and the flavor inside. So we did move, we had three criteria, move to a, a monomaterial plastic, which was readily or most more recyclable than others, so we chose HDPE, which is getting into your types, but that's that's the plastic that your milk jug... It's a highly have. recyclable plastic. Yeah, it's From number the recycling two. recycling Number two. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. this, yeah, next to PET, one of the most recycled. And then it had to feel like a tube because consumers don't like to change their habits, and it had to protect what was inside. So we find it took us, believe it or not, three to four years to develop that tube, so it met our criteria. And then we decided working with Ellen MacArthur Foundation that, to meet their definitions, in order to be recyclable in practice and at scale, which is 30% at least across mm -hmm. 400, a population of 400 million, um, we had to 
share the technology. So we shared the technology, including our competitors, and now, pleasingly, the four major toothpaste manufacturers are moving to the same tube or the same plastic. Mm -hmm. So that's a step in the right direction, very small step, but we didn't do that alone. We had to work with the Association for pa Plastic Recyclers, which is an American NGO that kind of sets the bar if, on what is or is not recyclable in the U.S., so that was an important partnership. We work with the recycling partnership in the U.S. to engage with the recycling infrastructure, like the material recovery facilities, the MRFs. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pleased to meet you guys here today because I'd love to talk to you more mm -hmm. offline following this because there's always something to share. Um, and of course, we've been longstanding partners with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Now, that's all good. The government, though, this is why we're we're very, we, we, we sent representatives to Ottawa to the U, UN Plastic Treaty. I mean, that's going to be ultimately what levels the playing field because we get back at these business models. We need those big, overarching, legally binding mm -hmm. um, principles or laws in place, if you will, to level the playing field, um, which will help companies come together and you know push past those alternatives <laughs> well, can so, I just say something really yeah. quickly just but just to illustrate a point is about the the business model so our grandparents did not use toothpaste the, let me just say like so we we create need right so our great-grandparents did not even have glad bags because they didn't throw as much stuff away they didn't have as much disposable stuff. Somehow, you know, we've convinced people throughout the world who had their own practices of, of bodily care and moisturizing, you know, who had their own moisturizers, their own miswak and other things that they chewed, that they have to have products that come in plastic to be able to survive and be healthy and be clean. So we created the need, we created the market that now we're saying people can't move away from. And this is, this is what boggles me, you know? And it, it's the same with like, you privatize the water, and so then how do you get it to people? It has to be in bottles, because the water's privatized. So we literally created, I f sometimes I feel like I'm in the matrix. Like we, we created the need for it. So I, I mean, I just you need I know, toothpaste. and I'm not saying toothpaste. The number one. Oh, and I do chew. I chew toothpaste, and my kids chew toothpaste okay. too. They but love it. They toothpaste. love the toothpaste. But I'm not Please saying we don't. Teeth. But we actually, you know, I, I just wonder, you know, maybe the the problem is not necessarily the plastics, but that we begin to sort of mass market things that maybe there were alternatives to, and that those things work together. The plastics and the the lotions, the creams, the whatever it is, the consumption, consumption the, the things we feel like we need to buy in order to feel whole. Like it's part of, you know, that's why I say it's hard to, for me to talk about just plastics because this is part of something much bigger and it is, it is a consumerist society where we, we have to buy what everyone else, we have to buy what the commercial says to buy. Mm -hmm. Right. And, so. and, I, and ideally, the transition to a circular economy would, would involve, you know, whatever products remain, hopefully only the ones that are necessary. I'm very much for that. Cut out the unnecessary. But uh, that's personal. Sorry. But but it, it's changing how those products operate and also how we as the general public interact with those products that we see inherent value in containers and we don't see them as disposable. I, I think that's a base. So whatever we do actually use. Right. We are then this is far in the future and a big change. But we do then want to reuse things and keep things in that circular economy in the cycle. Uh, I'm going to close this out with the last question, and then we will open it up to the audience in a very short number of minutes. Thank you for what I have to remain with structure at least somewhat. Um, but the last question is really for everyone. How do we balance the responsibility between consumer, corporates, and improving waste management systems? I'm happy to start if that's... I, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, so, Definitely. you know, that's, we have to figure that out. But we can't, consumers don't like to be yelled at. <laughs> nope. So we have to figure out how mm. to con communicate with consumers. We do a lot of work trying to understand the consumer. You have to incentivize them. Incent yeah. Yeah, and inconvenience, I would argue, as well. It has yeah, to be as easy as price. possible. Right, right. One of the... Um, I think the important focal points for this discussion, like we've got to 
decouple production from economic prosperity and financial return. Mm -hmm. And that right now feels really hard to grasp because as you just articulated, right, it's like so now embedded in the in our systems. We like produce things that sometimes we need, sometimes we don't for co consumption and you sell more things, you get more money. And I think that is just a reality of how our system works right now, but it has all of these incredibly horrific consequences for our communities and our climate. And like I think about the incinerator example that you gave, right? Like there is very clear scientific data that shows an increase in healthcare costs and cancer mm -hmm. rates in these mm -hmm. areas, like mm -hmm. the radius, right? And that's not moving companies to stop incinerating. So like I do think that the economic argument, it has to be there for the, the moment that we're in right now. And part of the economic argument is policy and public sector intervention and we don't have that right now we're subsidizing the linear economy right and so it is winning <laughs> it's it's actually like a, quite an easy equation and so to get local communities states federal level and then really global global treaty is one of the bright spots but there's got to be more to align around that reduction and the decoupling of economic prosperity yeah general public, we do not hold accountable elected officials who pass policies that do not center justice or people's lives and health at the center of, of what's going on. And I personally say this must be the justice century because until we do that, it's only going to be economic policy, but the lie, and there will continue to be sacrifice zones and disposable communities, and there will actually then be experimentation, which we could, will call resilience and other things that happen, but only in the communities that have already been experimented on and sacrificed on. Anyway, I finally remembered. It's the Basel Treaty. I mm. wish you would look it up at some point. And the Bamako Accord, because the Basel <coughs> Treaty was the production company uh, countries, the so-called agreed to no longer send to receiving countries, the global south, um, to have breakdown and dismantling of products that are dangerous. But I was excited by, and all this is like 20 years ago, the Banco Accord was the receiving country said, well, we ain't gonna take it anyway. <laughs> so y'all can make the Banco Treaty, but we're not gonna bring it into our borders because you had children with no protective equipment whatsoever, working on, you know, in Ghana and other places, dismantling electronics. I mean, the mm -hmm. what we, it is criminal, or it should be. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of what we're saying. And I mean, and look, I sat for 17 years on a Fortune 1000 co corporation board uh, for interface, it was carbon, we create and recycle property because we do not design products in a way so they can be readily taken apart. So you get a tetra pack, whatever else you think. You know, okay, so you have a shelf life for what normally would be otherwise a, a refrigerated product can then be done. But the Bundestag in Germany says you must recycle everything when it never having been designed to pull that metal layer out. So the cost then becomes prohibitive. So until we have better coordination and connection between the rules that are made, the impact that they have on the lives of, the, and I wasn't even on the panel. Well, and I think that that's putting the to sort of wrap us up. We're about to transition to questions, but that that it's really everyone's responsibility. Designers need to be, you know, packaging designers designing for reuse or recycling. Uh, municipalities need to be working with local recycling facilities to make sure items can actually be, you know, processed, collected, recycled. Um, consumers and residents need to be re-educated as to, you know, what can you reuse? How do you reuse it? What can you recycle? What can you not? And then, yeah, I love this now. Let's bring the health department in there as well. I, I mean, obviously and absolutely, so that we can allow for reuse regulation. Um, anyone else wanna? 
add to responsibilities before we go to audience. All right. I just want to go to my last slide. (laughs) Let's see it. Because I, being that I was the only one with slides, I didn't really go through them. You see all the, yeah, this is, sorry, I just want to go back. You know, like, do you really want to be breathing that in? Is that what you really want your job to be? Um, Okay. Sorry. Points of it. Yeah. I just want to leave, you know, that slide. And Kate, resources. Please do take a photo. Thanks. <laughs> Follow up. Uh, I thank you so much for your patience. I would love to open us up to audience questions. Uh, we have someone here. Yeah, thanks for waiting. And I think someone will bring you a microphone if, if you'd like. It's coming right now. I'm okay. okay, great. Um, as a retired uh, primary care provider, uh, nurse me. practitioner, oh, yeah, yeah. I want to tell you that I'm appalled by the need that people feel for bottled water. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. uh, if you go into a supermarket, any supermarket, the shelves and shelves and shelves of bottled water. And the problem that I saw as a primary care provider is that people feel that that's the only safe water mm-hmm. there is to drink. And people who have very few resources mm-hmm. in terms of m- financial resources, and th- they feel that they really, for their health, have to have bottled water. And that's a myth. In, ma- we in, have in New York City, we have some of the best. Not all of our pipes are great. Make sure your pipes well, are good. <laughs> but in New York <laughs> City, if you're lucky to live in a <laughs> good building, we do have some of the best tap water but in the world. It, but in the United States, we have very good in water general, yes. to drink. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not everywhere. Please look it up. <laughs> but definitely in the city. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Yes, here in the blue, and then we'll come to the gentleman in front of you. Nice to see you, Kara. We've met a few Hello. Hi, Nandini. Um, yeah, so, I mean, this is all, this troubles me all the time. I'm a board member of Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board. We deal with this all the time, advocacy and fighting against plastic use. Um, I guess, you know, recently I, I heard about, I was sp- speaking to someone about this in a bookstore from Europe, from France, and it's just a small example of how she was uh, carrying like a you know a plastic like Starbucks like um, beverage container, and said you know this isn't allowed in Europe, this isn't allowed in Paris. Mm-hmm. You know, what could is Europe a model for us in some ways or other countries that are be- and and what are they doing that we're not doing to not have so much plastic use. That's my first question. And what can we learn, lessons learned? And is it part of, is it a business model? Is that involved or not? And I'd like to hear about that. The second question I have is about EPR. Um, What are the economic impacts of it? And how will it be economically feasible? No, not what is EPR. I'm saying uh, what are... I can, I can define... Oh, sorry. I'll define it after the question. Oh, I can to define clarify. it. Yeah, go oh, on. sorry. I Extended producer responsibility. So yeah. just... So financially speaking, how can it work such that the, um, uh, the costs aren't then uh, passed Pass down, down to, to the, the consumer? consumer. Mm-hmm. I, I will say one thing that in Europe, they have EPR, <laughs> uh, and they have more legislation uh, around uh, plastics and, and other forms of packaging. But, uh, and it has been found that that price does not get passed. In, in Europe and Canada, where this is already happening, we haven't observed the price being passed on to the consumer. But does anyone else want to add? And yeah. that goes back to you know the point about incentives. Yeah. So we have to incentivize folks. That I'm, I'm a big fan of pay as you th- pay as you throw program. Um, and I, I think it's been tried in New Jersey, and there's still just a couple of municipalities that have it. But it's hard to get people on board with it. But it, it makes a difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when and you see when you see the bottom line um, individually. Absolutely. Yeah, pay as you throw is when you actually specifically pay for the amount of waste you create. You see the bill. It's not hidden in your taxes as it is for us currently. Uh, any other, did you have a question? Yeah, please. A microphone. Or we'll probably hear. It's a small room. <laughs> ah, yes. Very good. I have a couple Thank of you. observations. Um, one is I took a, an informal poll of my friend Rick and me. Mm. We never recycled our toothpaste tube. We didn't know it was recyclable. Oh, right. Mm-hmm. I can so talk to that, that might be kind of important to get out there. Yeah. Um, I can tell you why we haven't. Another thing, and this might not be for this group, an observation um, microplastics. Mm-hmm. So I'm told that these dishwasher 
pellets mm -hmm. or full of microplastics. I go to stores, I can't buy anything but. Mm -hmm. The other stuff is off the shelves. Mm -hmm. um, and my third observation is there's very, very little talk about government, like federal intervention here. And I don't know why. This isn't, it's, it's funny because in a climate conference like we're having today, that's a conclusion that keeps getting reached. It's, it, an individual municipality can't figure out how to stop flooding that, that affects a whole coastline. Why do we think that the, that the producers are going to figure the way out of this? We didn't, we didn't ask the, the auto industry or the petroleum industry to get rid of lead and gasoline, or maybe it would be a good idea to put in airbags. It didn't work. We legislated it, and it went away. Yeah, we're, we're not going to have the producers come up with a really good idea by working together. They might. But why is there so little talk about what the federal government ought to be doing? Why are we allowed to buy our water in water bottles? That's my question. There is proposed federal legislation for, for EPR. It, it, is, it just hasn't gotten the movement yet. The, the movement has been happening on the state level. And yeah, federal would make it a lot simpler. We could make it simpler because it would, would be integrated, as I think someone was mentioning, that it's going to be a mess, EPR passing state by state. Um, because every state will probably do it a little differently and then producers will have to operate differently. So yes, federal would be ideal in some way. It just unfortunately isn't yeah. the climate. This, since we're the only two suits here, it looks like. <laughs> um, I, um, I want to add something to it that Anne brought up too. Uh, it's the difficulty of changing production. Um, I want to, as engineers, the two of us, I want to caution anybody here that and there are lying engineers too and there are lazy engineers too. And the one thing that really bothers me as an engineer personally is that I, you hear engineers say, well, we can't do it by that time. That's the moment when leadership has to say, well, then we need different engineers. And it happens too often that an industry will complain so we can convert and therefore give us a little bit more slack on the, on the uh, legislation while there are actually other corporations that have come up with the solutions and done the job and basically get thrown on the bus because now the competitive advantage is taken away. Mm -hmm. The point I'm making is make it aggressive. Make the engineers work really hard at finding solutions and don't listen to the ones that can't do it because they're just not good engineers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I was gonna say Anne should, yeah. And we hired actually <clears throat> a third party independent company called Stina whose role, they are also advocating, I don't know if you know Stina, mm -hmm. for tube conversion to recyclable. And they are, their role is to go to Colgate, to our competitors, to everybody, to check on their transition. Mm -hmm. And we hit a really big milestone. This was really exciting to us, probably not to you, but at the end of 2023 now, 90% of all tubes, toothpaste tubes in the US are now converted. Let's take one more question. Can we? Yeah, yeah so shout it out. Quick, quick, quick. Okay. Speedy, speedy. So I was in Chinatown two years ago. I was in Chinatown two years ago. There was a parade uh, running around oh, uh, like a few blocks um, advocating for a uh, younger generation, advocating for um, Earth Day, um, saying about um, Recla uh, claiming for the uh, responsibility of manufacturers about plastic, but ironically, when they end the um, uh, the the, uh, the parade, <laughs> I saw lots of plastic bottles yeah. on the floor, uh -huh. uh, food containers, plastic bags, mm -hmm. and um, that made me reflect on how we can do educational outreach not to only requesting the manufacturers to reduce or to improve the technology of uh, food packaging, um, uh, uh, food pa packaging material, but how, is there any existing program out there that you know that come across you or anyone on the floor that uh, we are doing it to change the behavior of our younger generation, including me and you? Yeah, our, our Department of Sanitation in New York City does have in-school programming, uh, and also students can come out and tour the facility where I work. That's a big part of my job, so you can see it all in action, and I, uh, I break down the process for you. Uh, you're welcome to speak with me more about that. I'd be happy to give you some resources. And with that, thank you so much for letting us go over a couple of minutes. Thank you so much to the panel for all the work that, that you're all doing. Uh, amazing. Thank you all for your questions. Have a great day.